Good morning, Friendly Hills Church. I'm grateful to be able to gather with all of you, my brothers and sisters in the Lord. We're also glad to have some of you who have joined us because you've been invited to come and watch our YouTube video or you've just stumbled upon it. Great to have you. We hope that you will be willing to come and join us when we're able to gather together again. I'm Nathan. I'm one of the pastors here at Friendly Hills Church, and we are glad to be together with all of you this morning. Good morning, Friendly Hills Church. And to any guests who are listening in, welcome. It's good to have you here through the internet as we're meeting together digitally. We like to start our worship services off with a call to worship. And this morning it's gonna be from Psalm 24, a Psalm of David. So please listen along in your hearts as we meditate together on this Psalm to get our hearts prepared for worship as best we can this morning. Psalm 24, Song of David. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not lift his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him who seek the face of the God of Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your hearts, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Selah. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that as we meet together in spirit in separate locations, that your Holy Spirit would open the gates of our hearts, that we may receive what you have for us this morning and glorify you in our worship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, please join us as we sing, Rejoice, the Lord is King.
Now is a time in our worship where we like to read a corporate confession. And what that does is it leads us into personal confession. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this confession. The words will be on the screen. And you, if you're willing, can read along with me. And it's going to serve as a reflection for our hearts as we seek to come into worship with a heart of repentance and humility. So please follow along with me as we reflect on this confession of sin. O Holy One, we call to you and name you as eternal, ever-present, and boundless in love. Yet there are times, O God, when we fail to recognize you in the dailiness of our lives. Sometimes shame clenches tightly around our hearts and we hide our true feelings. Sometimes fear makes us small and we miss the chance to speak from our strength. Sometimes doubt invades our hopefulness and we degrade our own wisdom. Holy God, in the daily round from sunrise to sunset, remind us again of your holy presence hovering near us and in us. Free us from shame and self-doubt. Help us to see you in the moment-by-moment -moment possibilities to live honestly, to act courageously, and to speak from your wisdom. Amen. Now's the time where we like to enter into a time of silent reflection and silent personal confession. So there's gonna be a moment of silence on the screen and as best you can uh, from your homes, please uh, take this time to repent of any sins that come to heart and then we'll read our gospel assurance. Hear now the assurance of pardon, the gospel to you, repentant sinner. It's from John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Receive this gospel blessing and may it settle your hearts that you can continue in worship with joy. Good morning. This morning in the Heidelberg Catechism, our questions are gonna to refer to questions 22 and 23, where the Apostles' Creed is recited in a profession of what we believe. The preceding questions refer to articles within the Creed to help clarify what we believe as we profess it together in worship. Question 35, what is the meaning of conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary? Answer, that the eternal Son of God, who is and continues true and eternal God, took upon himself the very nature of man, of the flesh and blood of the Virgin Mary, by the operation of the Holy Spirit, so that he might also be the true seed of David, like unto his brethren in all things except for sin. Question 36. What benefit do you receive from the holy conception and birth of Christ? Answer. That he is our mediator and with his innocence and perfect holiness covers in the sight of God my sin wherein I was conceived. Hi, Friendly Hills Church. Um, I'm 
Rachel. I know many of you know me. I know many of you, um, but for those of you who don't, I am currently a missionary and teacher in southern Mexico. I'm um, here currently, and life looks so different, as I know it looks very different in the States right now as well. Um, it's a little noisy outside right now as uh, people are working from home, so I apologize if it's hard to hear, but I'm um, excited to, to share a little bit about life here. Uh, so as the coronavirus has put a, a pause on many things, um, school obviously has been impacted with that as well. So this Monday we get to move into teaching online, and honestly I'm really excited. I've missed my kids, I've missed their families, and I'm looking forward to getting to interact with them every day and to see how they're doing and check up on their work and to send videos and get videos from them. And so um, one way you can be praying as a church for me and, and this ministry is um, just for our students um, as many of their families have been impacted uh, financially by this virus. Um, be praying that their needs are met that they are able to eat and their families are able to pay rent and many of the things that make them feel safe and secure are not threatened. Um, also, be praying that um, school is a joy um, for them and not a burden. And that's my heart as their teacher is to bless them and to encourage them and to um, give them exciting things to do and um, help them to see this, this world and learn about this world that God's created. and. Um, so excited to get to do that. So pray for me as I'm planning and organizing and, and teaching them that it would be encouraging and fun and um, that their hearts would would be reminded to trust in Jesus and to rely on Jesus and the uncertainty um, of this time. Um, and pray for our school as we are finding ways to, to love families that are in great need. Um, our town is a, a beach town and it's known for its waves. Um, so many come to surf here and um, from around the world and with the halt in tourism, it's it's definitely affected families. And so we're looking to also serve those that have been most affected by this. And so please be praying as um, we begin sending care packages out and checking up on families um, and providing physical needs for them. And so just pray that um, that we're able to be genuinely like the hands and feet of Christ here and that um, people would um, see that and feel that and that it wouldn't boast of, of us, it wouldn't, um, wouldn't make us look good, that it would just point to our good Father um, that loves and provides for us. And so pray that that would be the message communicated. Um, pray that families would be encouraged and yeah, pray for the teachers as we are navigating this this new this new form of teaching. Um, that we would do it well and um, it would love and serve our, our families well. So thank you for praying for me. I'm praying for many of you. I know there's a lot going on there, um, and I wish I could spend send a 10 minute video talking about it. But know that I'm praying for you. I miss you guys. I wish I could hug so many of you right now, um, but right now we're all social distancing and that's not even an option even if I was there. So praying for you guys. Thank you for praying for me. Um, thank you for your encouragement. Love you guys and uh, look forward to the day where we do get to all hug each other and see each other again. So. Hey everyone, I'm really thankful that you continue to give and support the work here at Friendly Hills Church. This is normally the Sunday that we have communion and I'm really sad that we're not able to gather together and have communion together. But there's another thing that we do on this Sunday, which is we take a deacon's fund offering. And I would encourage you to give to that if you are able to, and that's one of your regular habits. It's uh, a huge help to our congregation right now and certainly to our community. So if you're able to, we would invite you to use uh, the online giving. Uh, you can mail in a check again, or you can use uh, your bank. Either way would be wonderful. We appreciate so much how generous you all have been to the ministry of Friendly Hills Church. Thank you. Here begins the sixth chapter of the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter six, beginning at verse one. But the Lord said to Moses, 
Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So the Lord said to Moses, Go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of this land. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. This is God's holy, inspired, and perfect word. May we receive it as such. There are three things we look for in a crisis. We look for friends who will support us. We look for leaders who will direct us in the right way. And we look for a God who will hear us and help us. But what if all those things don't happen? What if our friends abandon us? What if our leaders fail us? What if God doesn't hear us? Then what do we do? Well, the answer to that question is right here in Exodus chapter 6, because the people feel exactly that way. They feel like their friends have abandoned them, that their leaders have failed them, and that God is not listening to them. And so our text informs us that when this happens, what we're to do is we're to look to God's promises, because it tells us there what God will do. As Josh said last week, Things are going to get worse before they get better. And what we see here in chapter 5 and chapter 6 is things are beginning to get a lot worse. And so we also get to see everyone's reaction to the process of things getting worse. We see how the people respond. We see how the leaders respond. We even see how Pharaoh responds. And we see how God responds. Let's take a look. Just a quick footnote about today. We're just going to be dealing with chapter 6, verse 1. And to do that, we're going to go back into chapter 5 and look at three separate verses that really inform chapter 1 of verse 6. And in that, we're going to have, all right, this is what we're going to see as our outline. We're going to, number one, see what the people see. We're going to look at it from their perspective. We're going to see, number two, what the leaders see and what their perspective is. And number three, we're going to see what Pharaoh sees and what his perspective is. And then finally, we're going to see what God has promised to do. So first of all, one key verse to understanding God's response in chapter 6, verse 1 is chapter 5, verse 21, because this helps us to understand what the people see, what their perspective is. Here's what they say. Chapter 5, verse 21. And they said to them, the Lord look on you, that's Aaron and Moses, the Lord look on you and judge you because you have made a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hands to kill us. Wow. Interesting response, because this tells us that all the people can see is Pharaoh's decree and the reaction by Moses and the leaders. They believe that Pharaoh is intent upon killing them and that he will succeed. 
And they believe that Moses and Aaron cannot protect them, and they believe that God cannot help them. Now, it's not unlike our own country in this pandemic. All that people can see around us is what the president says, or what Governor Cooper says, or what our local government says. And on both sides, people are in disagreement. Some people believe we should remain sheltered in place. Other people think that we should let uh, the economy go free. And the truth is, either way could destroy us. Either way could be a colossal mistake on our part. Because the truth is, the best that we can see as humans is not enough. The only good thing about this pandemic is that we will find ourselves in a mess that only God can extract us from. And that's what the people in Exodus chapter 5 and chapter 6 of Exodus find. They find that they are in a predicament that only God can deliver them. This is the book of Exodus, seated right in the heart of the Pentateuch. It's a book of beginnings. And these stories teach us more than, the, than just the faith of our fathers. These stories demonstrate a general human condition, which we all suffer from. And the truth is, this pandemic or other crises that we might face are going to go away. But we will still not have the ability to help ourselves out of our problems. We will always think that we're able to help ourselves and we will always fail at it. That's what the people see. What do the leaders see? Chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done this evil to your people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Let me just say, that's a pretty bold prayer. Uh, uh, can you imagine praying that out loud on the Wednesday night prayer meeting? Uh, God, we expected you to come help us, and all you've done is terrible things to us. Uh, why are you sending us out to lead this people? Every time we try to do something, you seem to muck it up. You don't even care for your people at all. Now, the truth is, we often do feel that way, but we don't have the guts to pray that out loud. But I'm guessing you have prayed that prayer in your head. Now, you might think that prayer, and you probably have never prayed it out loud, but here you notice that Moses actually records his own prayer, his own pitiful prayer for all the world to see and for the next 10,000 generations to notice this pitiful prayer by Moses. That's not much of a resume for a leader. But this is the Moses who saw the face of God. This is the Moses who was considered the most humble human in all existence. This is the Moses that God loved because Moses is deadly honest with God. God can handle his honesty. And that's why God, Moses is considered a friend of God. Okay, so what did the leaders see? Well, they see themselves as trying really hard to keep the people positive and moving forward in a hopeful way. And yet God seems to be working against them rather than working for them. Or to put it in Joshua's terms from last week, it is getting a lot worse before it's getting better. And it doesn't seem like it's ever going to get better. Here's the problem. When things start to get worse, it does feel like they'll never get better. And leaders are supposed to have vision. They're supposed to be out there helping us get through this hopeless time, getting us through the darkness. I mean, there are great stories out there about leaders who had this extraordinary vision, this tunnel vision to be able to help people get through an extremely difficult time. That's not this story. That's not this Moses. This Moses, this leader has no vision. You've heard of uh, nyctalopia, it's called night blindness, or the inability to see when the light dims. This is what I would call hope blindness. Moses can see no hope. 
Moses has absolutely no ability to see how God can make this better. Now, that's not a great place for a leader to be. It's certainly not a great place for a spiritual leader to be. However, all of us have been there at some point in some time, and some of us are probably there right now in our lives. Every single one of us have a place in our lives where we feel hopeless and we feel that God will not help us out. Now, it's easy to judge, judge our leaders. We're all armchair quarterbacks when it comes to football and politics and family decisions and church decisions. All of us suddenly become experts on everything from uh, epidemiology to economy and microbiology and sociology and psychology and theology. The truth of our passage, though, is that even if you had all of these things, even if you had all of these abilities, even if you had all of these gifts, even if you could have everything that you dreamed about, you still could not hack your way out of the situation. And that says something about this pandemic. Even with all of our wisdom, even with all of our understanding, we have no hope unless God intervenes. So that's what the people see, and that's what the leaders see. And here's what's most interesting. What does Pharaoh see? Let's look at chapter 5 and verse 2. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him in his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and more, moreover, I will not let Israel go. Now, you might think for a minute that Pharaoh is being sarcastic. But again, even like Moses, Pharaoh is just simply being honest. He's being brutally honest. You see, here's how Pharaoh understood the world. He believed himself to be a direct descendant of Amon Re, the god, the sun god, the great god of Egypt. <clears throat> so he doesn't know any other gods. He's not aware that any other gods exist. And when Moses says to him, Yahweh, the God of Israel, says, let my people go, Pharaoh's simply saying what he honestly thinks. Who is Yahweh? I don't know him, and I don't know him, so why should I obey him? The truth is, much of our culture has that same question. Who is God? And it's not sarcasm, and in many cases, it's not even hostility. It's just an honest question. Who is God? And why should I change my lifestyle for this God? Besides, I don't see any unity between the people who acknowledge this God or claim this God. They don't seem to agree. And I don't know why I should follow him or believe in him or trust him. And often what happens is we misunderstand their honesty and we push them further into the darkness by putting them on a guilt trip. Well, you should, you should understand God. You should believe God instead of inviting the honesty of their question. That it is hard to understand, especially in a crisis, if there is a God. So we find here in our text that winning the battle for the heart and mind is not up to us. This is God's specialty. He's the one that brings light into darkness. And people being honest about their questions of God is the first ray of light into that darkness. We should pay attention. So that brings us to point four, what God does. Okay, chapter six, verse one. But the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to the Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. I have three observations about this verse that I want you to notice. First, no one's on God's side. The people are not on God's side. The leaders are not on God's side. Pharaoh definitely is not on God's side. <clears throat> and yet, God doesn't need them to be on his side in order to save his people. This is what's cool about this verse. God doesn't need them. God doesn't need people to be on his side. As a matter of fact, the God of power and glory will shine greater in these moments when there's nobody on his side. <clears throat> this is the Exodus. <clears throat> this is the Old Testament's example of God's great redemption story, which points to 
and is only replaced by Jesus on the cross. Nobody's going to think, nobody in Jesus' time thought that the cross was God's way out of the darkness. Not God's enemies who crucified Jesus, not even God's people who were there and watched Jesus die on the cross, nor were his leaders, his disciples. None of them believed that the cross was the way through this crisis. Even now, people find it difficult to believe that the cross is the way that God uses through crisis and darkness. It's hard for us to comprehend that God might choose the most difficult way through a trouble in order that everyone might see his almighty glory and power. You see, when our story seems to have no hope, that's when God works most powerfully. And so I'd like to ask you, where are you? When you think about your life right now, and the pandemic may be the least of your worries, or the least crisis in your life right now, but I want you to think about that one area where you've completely lost hope. A place where you feel that God will never visit you with his mighty power, that God will never show up, that he, that he will never be there for you. And that's where God promises that he will show up in a way that you never expect. Second observation is that God causes Pharaoh to obey him even though he refuses to acknowledge that Yahweh is God. You see, this passage is all about God's sovereign plan and his control over his creation. I mean, what a huge irony. God uses a man who literally opposes him with every fiber of his being to be energetically in obedience to that same God. Pharaoh doesn't let God's people go. He doesn't just sort of say, okay, you can go now. What does the text say in verse 1? It says, with a strong hand, he will send them out. With a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. The Hebrew word here for drive is garesh, which means to thrust out or push out or to drive out. Let me give you an example. A few years ago, I used to do beekeeping as a hobby, and uh, I decided on one rainy day to go visit my bees. Now, I was a young beekeeper because an old beekeeper was said, don't go visit your bees on a rainy day. That's not a good day to check your bees out. I didn't know that. And there's reasons why you don't check your bees out on a rainy day. Number one, nobody is working out in the field. Everybody is home. That means in your average hive, 80,000 bees are home playing canasta and really grumpy because they're not out collecting nectar and doing what they really love to do. So anyway, I went in there, began to check them out. The bees just started swarming all over the place. I tried to smoke them down. That just made them worse. And what happened was I had a little tiny hole in my bee veil, and one of those little buggers found that hole. She blew her bee trumpet, and boom, they all come swarming in that one little hole. Suddenly, there were like 40 or 50 bees swirling around inside my veil and not outside of my veil. So I took off running, lickety-split, threw my veil off, started slapping at the back of my head. If they'd have had a video, I would have made the $10,000 uh, prize easily on America's Funniest Home Videos. The point of this is, the bees drove me away from their hive. It's not that I wanted to go, it wasn't my plan to go, but that's exactly what they did. And that's what happens to Pharaoh. He doesn't want to drive them out. He doesn't want to, to uh, push them away. He wants them to stay and be his slaves forever. But instead, God puts him in a place where he pushes them out and says, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Now that's a truth that you can really hang on to. And to never forget that God can even use evil men and women with evil purposes and evil designs to do his will energetically. Proverbs 21.1 says, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wills. Now Solomon is not just referring to nice Christian kings. He's referring to all kings and leaders. And you can put the, the name of any position you want in that proverb. 
You can say the heart of the president, the heart of the dictator, the heart of the governor, the heart of my boss, the heart of my supervisor. God can turn his or her heart any way that he chooses. And if God turns their heart against you, then that's what God has desired to do, and he will bring good out of it, even if it gets worse for a while before it gets better. Wow. That is powerful stuff. You might be in a transition now. You maybe have just found out that you're one of those non-essential folk in our community. Well, I have good news for you. God doesn't ever consider you non-essential. And God can use even this evil thing where you've been driven out of your work to be for your good, for God's glory. Another thought here. <clears throat> Let's not let politics get the best of us during this time. All of us get caught up in the traffic jam of politics and forget that God is the director of the traffic. Evil people with evil motives of power and control carry out evil actions, but they cannot outmaneuver the grace and redemption of our loving God, who can take the most heinous acts of men and women and turn them into gold and jewels for his people. He can turn them in to the eternal kingdom that will never pass away. And the truth is, we're meant to be disillusioned by politics. We're meant to think this is not the way things ought to be because it should cause our hearts to hunger for a true king and for a true kingdom that God will bring in in his time and in his way. Number three, God uses faulty leaders to help us understand his incomparable glory. Now, I like this. Right on the heels of Moses' pitiful prayer, God promises this impossible promise. Now notice, God doesn't chide Moses for his unbelief. He doesn't put him on a guilt trip for his inability to understand God's overarching plan. He doesn't say to him, Moses, I can't believe you don't trust me. What's the matter with you? Stop being a big baby and let's get on this salvation train with me. But neither does God coddle him. Okay? He doesn't try to stroke his ego or make him feel better about himself. Oh, now, Moses, I understand. Why don't you, that you can't see everything? Don't be so hard on yourself, Moses. Encourage yourself a little bit. No, God doesn't do either of those things. He doesn't put him on a guilt trip, and he doesn't coddle him. God simply tells him what he's going to do. God says, you know, Pharaoh doesn't believe me. Obviously, the people don't understand me. And even you, Moses, you're having a hard time believing me, too. But that doesn't matter because I'm going to save this people. I'm going to do good for them. You just watch and see what I'm about to do. And you will see that Yahweh is God. As a leader among God's people, and all of us are leaders, God has called all of us to lead in some place, in some way, from the greatest CEO among us down to the least among us. Every single one of us has influence somewhere in our leader. This truth helps us to move in our leadership. Number one, it helps us not to put guilt trips on ourselves or the people that we lead. There's no need to try to motivate people by guilt. It never works anyway. And secondly, it helps us not to coddle ourselves or the ones that we lead. We're not here to make them feel sorry or to, to feel sorry for them or, or, or make them feel sorry for themselves. We're here to help them see the mighty power of God at work in his people, saving his people time and time and time again. You see, this truth will help you lead your people back to God again and again. So what are we meant to do with this truth about the Exodus? We're to use this truth to fight our fear. Now, we often find ourselves fearful about the outcome of our leaders' decisions in this pandemic. We don't know if we should side with this side of leadership or this side of leadership. And we don't know what it means for our life and we don't know what it means for our work or for our small business. But in the darkness, know that God will bring light even through a poor decision by one of our leaders, God can still work to redeem and change and bring good out of evil. 
So use this truth to fight your fear. Use this truth to fight your stuckedness. In other words, when you feel stuck and can't move forward or backwards, use this truth to help you when you're stuck. Now, you might be stuck in your life right now, but this passage is saying God is never stuck. God is always on the move. The truth is, it can help you live patiently in a time of being stuck, kind of like us right now. God, we have to wait until God opens a way one way or the other by his mighty power. And thirdly, use this truth to lead you back to Jesus. The greatest part of this truth is, is that even in this crisis, even in this darkness, even in this time of loneliness and everything that these people and these leaders experienced, Jesus Christ on the cross experienced more pain, more sorrow, more loneliness than they did so that he could save them out of their darkness and out of their loneliness. This trouble drags us back to the truth about Jesus. Because when we experience pain, when we experience darkness, when we experience loneliness, we know one truth for certain, Jesus experienced more and did so for our sake. And it helps us understand the heart of Jesus. If Jesus is willing to go this far for me and further, how much he must love me and how much he must take care of me. You'll be refreshed by that truth again and again, by knowing what Jesus has done for you in the time of crisis. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to lift up to you our time together as a people. Although we're separated because of this pandemic, we want to trust in you. We want to be those who are able to address our fear by the truth of your almighty power. We want to be those who can address our impatience as we're stuck and can't move and know that somehow, some way, you will work out gold and glory for us. And we want to know Jesus. We want to see him glorified during this time. For we pray this, Jesus, in your name and for your sake. Amen.
Good friends in Christ, it's so good to be able to uh, be together in this way. But I still miss you. I long for the day when we can be together again, where we can shake hands again and hug each other's necks again, where we can see each other eye to eye and know that we're together. But until that time, I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to bring God's word to you, and I'm honored to do that. And so now I ask you, receive this benediction, this blessing from your God. And now may the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit give you peace this day and the days to come. Amen.